All right, let's begin with uh, a word of prayer, and then we will begin our study for today. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity once again to study your word. Thank you, Lord, for the modern technology that allows us to be able to do this over thousands of miles. Be with the students who are not quite here yet. May you help them to be able to sign on or to get to their place of study so they can join with our class today. I bless them and watch over these men and their wives as they uh, seek to serve you in their churches or in their schools or Bible colleges. Uh, bless them and encourage them, Father, wherever they are in India and even the countries around there. And use me as your teacher today for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, men, today for our class, uh, there was no homework due. It was just for you to read Genesis 6 through 8 and then uh, three times, and then to could start thinking about and praying about your next sermon. Uh, I will, at the end of today's class, plan to assign you the next sermon and um, to get, let you know that. And also, as far as schedule is concerned, we are uh, approaching the end of our class. And I'm looking at probably, now my calendar won't open. We're probably looking at having about three to four more classes, depending on how it goes after today, uh, maybe with ending on either November 10th um, or 17th. It just kind of matters. I, I have a trip um, I'll be taking uh, to, to do some preaching at a missions conference, and I will probably be taking that week off. I'll tell you more about that as that gets firmed up. But we have just a few more weeks to go, so press on and uh, be working on a sermon that we'll probably have to do next week or the week after, and then uh, we'll, we're almost done the class. So um, we'll talk about that at the very end. But let's go ahead and get back into Genesis chapter 6, and we're dealing with the Noah and the ark. So Genesis chapter 6, and we'll, we'll back up a little bit and get right into where we were last week. Uh, chapter 6 really ending with verse 8, uh, or beginning with verse 8 of Genesis 6, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And what a wonderful teaching and encouragement that is. Uh, here, this man felt very much alone. Sometimes you men can feel very much alone in your ministries and wonder, does God even know that I'm here? Does God know what I'm doing? And uh, the answer to that is yes, he does. He, he's aware of what you're doing. He's, he's uh, very much aware of your ministry. And he is watching over you. And, and you're, you can find grace and his blessing in your ministry. So <clears throat> don't be discouraged. Though everyone else around you seems to be in opposition to you. That's how Noah felt. And God greatly can use Noah. And he greatly can use you. So let's get into this and find out how God did use Noah. Verses 9 and 10, we find out about Noah and his family. I believe this is a slide that we ended on last week. Noah and his family. It says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And just a reminder uh, that Noah, even though he was very different from all the rest of his neighbors, he was a just man, which meant uh, in Old Testament terminology means he was a righteous man in the sense that he found his righteousness in, uh, in the Lord, not in his own good works. He sought to do what was right. That's the idea of perfect. He wasn't without sin, but he, was, he sought to do what's right. These are similar terms we have with uh, Job uh, in Job chapter 1. But he sought to please God. He sought to walk with God. He sought to do what was right. He sinned just like you and I did, um, but or like you and I do. But he was a just man. He put his trust in the Lord. He was looking forward to the, the promised Messiah that, that God first promised to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. So you see, you see that going on. But then in verses 11 through 13, so it reminds us, we saw a little bit of this up earlier in the chapter, verses 5, 6, and 7. But here, verses 11 through 13, it says, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, 
for all flesh. And notice the emphasis on the universality, the words all. For all, verse 12, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come up before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And so God is emphasizing through Noah uh, the universality of human wickedness, of the sin, of the corruption. It's only gotten worse uh, since Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree. It only continued to get worse and worse as, as Cain did his own thing and chose his way, Cain's way over God's way and uh, the curse of Cain. It only got worse as Cain's descendants like Lamech said, you know, Cain did this and got away with it. I can do so much more and get away with it. That's wickedness. That's depravity. Uh, it's only it's only got worse and worse uh, as as the um, earlier on in this chapter we saw the wickedness of man and every thought of his heart was continually evil. As Isaiah the prophet said, "All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every man to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on." on the Lord Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. Or as Romans 3 goes through, and we're not going to do it for time's sake, but Romans 3 reminds us, we are just bent toward wickedness as people. It doesn't matter where we live, no matter if we live in India, or if we live in Africa, or if we live in America, uh, we, are, we have that, our, our natural bent as people uh, is toward evil. That's because we are all descendants of Adam and Eve, and we actually are all descendants through Noah as well. And so um, God saw the wickedness, and so his only his his solution, God's solution, is that he's going to destroy human flesh that he had created in his image in Adam and Eve. He's going to destroy human flesh. The only ones that will be rescued, the only ones that will be saved delivered from destruction would be those who were in the ark he's gonna build this he was gonna make he's gonna instruct noah to build an ark for safety and for protection of those who put their faith in the lord and not in their own wickedness and their own sinfulness you know, jesus talked about that um matthew 24 you know as in the days of noah people just went along their normal ways of life it is until even the water began to fall People continue their own sinful ways and their own lifestyles. But God says, finally, now, uh, I will, very sad statement in verse 13, I will destroy them, humans, uh, our, our ancestors, with the earth. And so, um, anyway, that, that's God's telling Noah what's going to have to happen because of the universality of human wickedness, moral corruption, depravity. Like I said, Romans 3 just reminds us this is our natural bent, um, explaining it. Our mouths are wicked. Uh, our, our feet run to shed blood. Our hands look for ways to benefit ourselves. Our eyes look on things which are wrong. You know, our, our ears listen to the wrong, the wrong music or the wrong, our ears listen to the wrong words of gossip, whatever it might be. All these things is just because our normal navel, natural depravity, sinful depravity leads us away from God. That's why Christ had to come and die on the cross. We understand that. We're preachers. We preach this. But this is also why God destroyed all human flesh that was outside the ark. Because he's going to give them a choice. He's going to give them an opportunity because Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He's gonna, Noah's going to preach to them for 100 years. And those who choose to go God's way will get on the ark, and those who choose their own way will, will die, will be destroyed. That's the word he used here, the word destroyed. It's a very strong word. We'll see that word come up again and again. So God said, I'm going to make, but for those who put their faith in me, for those who, who will listen to the message of Noah and believe, uh, I want you to make an ark. Okay, so let's move on to verses 14 through 16. Genesis 6. Uh, so this is a command of the Lord, verse 14, make thee an ark of gopher wood, specialized type of tree that grew over there in the, in the arid region 
uh, of, it may even still grow in your, your country today, I'm not sure, but a, a type of gopher wood. He says, rooms thou shalt make in the ark and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. And he gives dimensions. We'll so look at these dimensions in just uh, in the next slide, but it says the length of it shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 15 cubits, the height of it uh, 30 cubits, the window thou sh shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set on the side thereof, no one door, with lower, second, and third story shalt thou make it. So he gives us some basic details, not a lot of information, but we don't need a lot of information. Uh, he gave, I'm, I'm confident he gave Noah some more instructions, but he gave Noah some basic details to start with. What God was designing here, this ark was not like a cruise ship of today um, that carried people from one country to the next or one city to the next. It wasn't like a military ship uh, of today that uh, our countries have uh, to protect our countries and so forth. It was basically what I would call a barge. It was designed to hold things, living things, animals and people, and to keep them stable. And I'll, I'll show you some of the design ideas uh, about that. He talks about they need to make some rooms. And that's a Hebrew word, it could be translated nests. Uh, a nest is where animals live, where animals sleep and, and stay. Well, these are the rooms. He, he talked about having a window, and there's, there's discussion about that, probably a large window, uh, but that was for daylight because it'll be raining all that time, and, the, and there's no windows on the side of the boat, on the side of the ark to see out, so all they have to look up, they have to look up toward the sky, and then uh, once the rain would stop, after 40 days and 40 nights, they'd be able to begin seeing uh, the sky again, the sun again would be shining in like it does in our, our, our places. It will also provide some ventilation, some air to get in and out, uh, fresh air, because there's a lot of going to be a lot of animals on that ark. Um, and then lastly, he talks about the door. And uh, the door, of course, another example, like the ark is a type of Christ, even the door is a type of Christ. He is the door. Uh, into the ark, if you would, at the door of safety. Now, here is a design that I, I showed you a little bit last week, a design that was that's made actually by a Christian ministry uh, here in the U.S. called, uh, um, uh, this part is called the Ark Encounter. Um, now my mind went blank. Oh, Answers in Genesis. Answers in Genesis. And they've done a lot of research uh, by a preacher from Australia who actually came over to the United States and worked with another Christian ministry called Institute for Creation Research, uh, which I, I love both of these ministries. I've benefited a lot from these. But here's just a sample. No one knows exactly what the ark looked like. Um, but I want to show you this. This is what they propose. If you look where my finger is on top here, this is what they propose for the window. Actually, large open area that had a little roof to keep the rain out but, but it would provide um would provide ventilation and of course their idea of a window unlike ours in our day there was no glass in the window it was an opening it was an opening um i think we understand that so they didn't have glass in the window uh it was an opening it was for light and air uh ventilation to get through this is their idea. It may have been something like that. We're not, we just don't know for sure um, because people have not yet been able to find the whole ark and be able to do that. Though even this past week, I read an article um, about, uh, about some research about uh, what they believe is the ark, the finding the ark, because apparently this past summer was a, was a warmer summer in, the, in, the, in Turkey. And uh, they found some places, uh, they found some Jeep, um, some satellite imaging um, of a man-made thing, 17,000 feet above sea level, way up in the mountains. Uh, looked like a, a house or a home where something was built, but most of it's under the snow still and the ice from years, years past. And uh, so even this past week, I was reading an article about 
you know, this discovery really is becoming uh, coming out in science even this this uh, year. Um, whether this is the ark or not, it doesn't matter. And it says it doesn't change, won't change our faith, whether we believe in what God says in his word or not. Eventually, uh, eventually we just discovered, uh, I think. But anyway, the ark is what they talked about. Also notice, notice here how the ark is um, skinnier, in a sense, according to the dimensions. Of course, the dimensions here in verse 15 are cubits, basically uh, under the British standard. I'm not sure if you use the British standard or still measurements or if you change over to meters. Uh, but if you're familiar with the British standard, which I know they, they did use in India for a while, uh, a cubit is basically, or by definition, is basically your elbow to your to your middle finger. And on the average person, that's a that's between 15 to 18 inches. So when they would do a cubit in Bible times, basically it's from your elbow, from your middle finger, your tallest finger of your hand, all the way down your hand to your elbow. And on the average person, the average man, that's 15 to 18 inches. And so normally when they talk about a cubit, they're talking about approximately 18 inches, approximately a foot and a half for a cubit. So I'll give you some dimensions to that in just a second. Let's look at our next slide here as we continue to work through this. Uh, no, about the ark. God designed this ark, I put, as a rectangular box. Here are the dimensions both in feet, the British system, uh, as well as in meters, uh, which everyone you're more familiar with. So as far as its length is concerned, as far as the length is concerned, it would be 438 feet approximately or 140 uh, meters from the front to the back. As far as its width is concerned, from side to side, basically 73 feet or, um, or 23 meters wide. And as far as the height is concerned, from the bottom of the arc, to the top of the arc, 44 feet, and, or about 13 and a half meters. So this kind of shows you the dimension. It's, it's much more long, much longer than it is wide or high, and it's much wider than it is tall. And uh, so that just helps. That's what God's um, instruction was for that, uh, for Noah to build this ark. The ark was designed to float and not to tip over. There has been done by uh, creation scientists um, studies done on on this design, making uh, making arcs to scale, and then and then putting it in wave pools and things like that. And uh, this these dimensions, these proportions, they could not get the the, the um, the, the little boat they made to flip, to tip over. No matter how bad the waves were, how strong the waves were in the wave pool, it would not tip over. And that's of course what God designed it for do, it designed it to do, to, to preserve life. And not, not necessarily to go from one place to the next, but just to float, buoyancy, to be able to float and stable because there's living things. In fact, the only living things on earth would be in that ark. The, the people, the, the um, mammals, the reptiles, um, the, the dinosaurs, uh, even, even the uh, insects were going to be, and the birds, they're going to be inside this ark for, for many months. And so you need to be able to have a, a stable place to live and they need to stay afloat, could not sink. So this is going on about the ark as we continue through here. The ark had no steering system because it was designed, it was not designed for sailing or for cruising, but it was designed for the preservation of life. It was designed to keep people and living things alive. So Noah didn't have to take, and Noah and his sons did not have to take a course in how to navigate or how to go from one place to the next, or how to 
turn the, the ark around. They simply were riders. They were they simply were in the ark, riding out the storm as a place of safety in the midst of this terrible storm uh, and terrible terrible flood going on outside. And then, whoops. So then I, I have this design. This is also put out by, it says up here on top, Answers in Genesis. You can see that, Answers in Genesis. Um, they did a design basically of um, a, a rectangular box, very wide, a very long, 437 feet long, um, wide, and then the shortest area being its height. Uh, here are the numbers I gave you again, 73 feet wide, 44 feet high, and 437 feet long. And so a little bit of design, what it would look like, not, not, uh, not the same, and the same ministry did this, but the same ministry did this about 15 years later, they designed it even more, but it's basically a rectangular box designed to float. What they did down here is to show you in proportion what how how big an elephant was in comparison to the height and width how big a giraffe was with which is one of the tallest creatures still living today and even the dinosaurs um a medium-sized dinosaur and one of the largest dinosaurs i think this was a brontosaurus um how they compared to even the size of the ark and then you, uh, by comparison, that at scale, the size of a of one of the biggest airplanes that's in service today. That they've they recently built another very large one, two story one, but this is one of the biggest airplanes in in uh, service today, a 747 that will fly in and out of Delhi. Um, anyway, here here it is in comparison to the size of the Ark, so half the size, and um, uh, a little bit taller, the wing, the wing portion is a little taller than the uh, the whole arc would have been, and it's not as wide. These things are not as wide as that. So that gives you an idea proportion wise um, what the arc would have looked like, something like that. And of course, they still have designed perhaps the window was like this. Um, these were open areas. I'm sure occasionally water would splash in. Um, but it mainly was there for after the, after the, the flood ended, after the big part of the storm ended, mainly there for uh, light and, and always there for ventilation. These are the only way air, fresh air could get in and out of the ark through the windows up on top. So that's their, that's their idea of what the window will look like. We just don't know for sure because we actually have not found the, the whole part of the ark, uh, though people believe they have found portions of the ark, we have not actually found uh, the whole ark and so forth. And so, um, just an idea, um, a, a basic idea from the, the text of scripture. Okay, let's continue to work through here then. So, Noah and the ark. And so verse 17 goes on and says this, and behold, I, this is the Lord speaking, Lord God speaking, behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. And what's the purpose of doing that? To destroy all flesh. Here's that word again, very strong word, destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. Okay, so we need to go ahead and pause there again. There's some very strong statements the Lord makes. <coughs> concerning what he's going to do he's going to bring this flood so the the flood is described in chapter 6 verse 17 by the hebrew word mabal uh it's also used over in psalm 29 verse 10 uh, mabal is not just a a uh, little flood after a heavy rain it's not it's not even just um, the flooding from a say a typhoon though you you can have some pretty serious um, I think well you guys call them um, cyclones right is a cyclone or typhoon it, it hits India can one of you answer that do you call them cyclones or typhoons in your country
cyclones. Cyclone? Okay. So the cyclones, uh, they dump a lot of water and cause a lot of flooding. So that's, that's about as close as we get today. We call them in our country hurricanes. Uh, that's about as that's about as um, strong, that's about as close to the flood that we can imagine in our world today because God has promised us, as we know, and we'll be saying this, that he's not going to destroy the world again with a flood. But even then, it's localized. Like if you guys, if you have a cyclone that hits India, let's say it hits Chennai over on that side of India, it doesn't often affect Mumbai because your country's so big. But Noah's, the, the flood Noah's time affected the whole world. It was a worldwide flood. It affected uh, everyone who was alive, everyone who was living. And so uh, it's a, it, the Mubal, uh, it was worldwide destructive because God said he needed to destroy all flesh. Everything, all flesh that did not go into the ark would die. And that's emphasized time and time a lot again. Um, Verse 2 Peter 3, 6 hell, uses the word there, cataclysmus, uh, or cataclysmus, the Greek word, which, from which we get the English word, I'm sure you have in your vocabulary as well, a cataclysm, or cataclysmic is the, is the adjective, but a cataclysm, talking about a major destruction, that's from the Greek there in 2 Peter 3, and we will look at that uh, second period three uh, today, a little later. So we won't do it right now. But it's just very, the very strong statement God makes in verse 17 of, of Genesis 6. He is the one that's doing it. I mean, he makes it clear. Be, he says, verse 17, behold, I, even I, do bring the flood, do bring them a ball. So he is making it very clear that he is the one that is bringing this judgment because of man's the universality of men's sin. And so he, he specifies that and the purpose what by he's going to do it to destroy all flesh. And particularly he makes it clear wherein is the breath of life. So God is bringing this cataclysmic worldwide flood, uh, not some local or peaceful flood, uh, of just simply rising water or whatever else as destructive as that can be. Uh, it, it was a worldwide cataclysmic disaster of a flood that God brought. We'll look at Second Peter 3 later. Look at the third point here. Look at the third point. Genesis 6, 17 clarifies that the Lord sent the flood. And it's for the purpose of destroying all flesh, which had the, and it says there in chapter 6, verse 17, the breath of life. Now, we saw that earlier. We saw that back at the creation week in, in, in the day, uh, in day six, specifically, where chapter one, verse 30 says, it talks about into every beast of the earth, into every fowl of the air, into everything that creepeth on the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and there was so. In chapter two, verse seven. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So we know from, from the creation week that, of course, all humans had the breath of life and were made in God's image. But God even gave breath to other animals. You know, the animals, uh, the, the oxen, the cows, dogs, um, these things need to breathe, birds, these things need to breathe as well. Uh, the only things that really do not, do not need to breathe would be the fish and things like that that can live in the, in the oceans. And I'll get to that in just a second. But what God was trying to clarify is every human and land animal shall die, every one of them, except those in the ark. And he makes that very clear just a few minutes as we get further down through chapter six. And, and but we can say not all sea creatures, fish and whales would die, though many would die, many did die because of the cosmic events, because of all the the, the, the um, terrible storms and the earthquakes and the volcanic uh, um, things that happen, um, turmoil of the sea, 
because it wasn't just a flood that kept getting taller and taller and taller. It was the breaking up of the, of the deep and it was the water collapsing upon the earth. And so a lot of sea life, even though they did not need air, a lot of sea animals also died. And, uh, and that's why you find fossils all over the world, sea creature fossils all over the world, including on top of major mountains, uh, even in your Himalayans, the north of your country, in the Himalayans, there are uh, sea creature fossils up there of clams and of fish and oysters and other sea creatures. There are fossils of these things on your Himalayan mountains, thousands of feet above sea level. But at one time, they were, they were under the water as the flood took place. So God clarifies this. He's going to use this flood, this terrible flood, for the destruction of all human flesh and all animal flesh, and every, especially that which had the breath of life. And this is how God would destroy those not on the ark. Okay, let's keep moving through this chapter. Fossil records indicate, you may be interested in this, as far as the ark is concerned, the fossil records indicate the average size of all animals, including dinosaurs, is that of a sheep. You, know, you think about, you think about uh, on the ark, how can all this, those big animals like dinosaurs and elephants and giraffes and rhinoceroses uh, how can they all fit on the ark? And, and this, is, of course, is one of the things that the skeptics used to ridicule about and, and uh, the silliness there. But when they looked at the fossil records, even of the dinosaurs uh, that had been found buried in, in the fossil record, find fossils of these things, uh, they were the average of all these different animals together. When they averaged them together, was that of, of a sheep, a little sheep, and we know you know what sheep are, and they're very small animals, if you would. They only stand two feet off the ground at the most, and they aren't very heavy. In addition to that, we can assume that the animals would be younger and smaller, so because they're younger. So maybe sheep, they're only let's just say they're a sheep, only a year old, two years old, and of course not just younger and smaller, but they also were younger in a sense they would be, um, have a, be able to reproduce. Um, they would, God wouldn't have brought onto the ark the older, beyond the reproducing years, or the older and larger elephants or giraffes, whatever else, he would have brought on the younger ones to fit on the ark as well. So we're still talking about the size of the ark and who he brought on. That's, Let's read a little more about that. Well, let's go on. Come back to that. Scientists estimated that the ark had 1.4 um, um, million cubic feet of space. Okay, and, and if you don't understand um, measurements and so forth, that doesn't make a lot of sense to you. But maybe what makes better sense to you, if you've never been near a really large barge, like they have in Mumbai or one of the one of your coastal cities, uh, maybe what would make better is the idea of train cars. And most of us have seen trains going down the train tracks. I've seen the trains in India uh, going down the train tracks. And so the ark could fit in it with, within the ark, uh, uh, approximately 522 train cars. The ones that are pulled behind the engines, the ones that pull the animals and pull the the um, the cargo to go from place to place, and the same train cars. Many of them have seen that uh, these train cars, very similar, same size, that are put on the back of your of your tractor trailer trucks, and then they're driven all across India delivering goods. You've seen on the back of your trucks, uh, tractor trailer trucks. I've seen them as well. And so the ark could hold about 500, over 500 of these train cars. These, um, another word might be container, container, um, containers, ship containers um, that you see on the back of the trucks. Basically, over 500 of those ship containers could fit inside the ark. That's about 1.4 million 
cubic feet of space. In, in, a, in the livestock cars that they have on the trains, they, they haul the animals along. And usually those are those cars are three levels, depending on whether it's cows or whether it be sheep. So in the sheep, we have three levels. That could hold approximately 125,000 sheep. 125,000 animals could be held uh, in there or in other words, inside the ark itself. Because people once again ridicule, skeptics ridicule and say, well, how can you fit all the, you know, two of every animal in the ark? There's not enough space. Well, actually there is, there's enough cubic space. And if it was designed correctly, as God told us earlier in verse, um, verse 16, end of verse 16, there were three levels to the ark, lower, second and third stories to the ark then uh, God was maximizing that space could fit those animals in there. Scientists also estimate there may have been 75,000 animals on the ark because, um, well, let me go and finish this, plus maybe a million kinds of insects. Because remember, not every, not every breed, for instance, dogs, not every breed of dog would need to be on the ark. There's, there's crossbreeding that's taking place. There are dogs that have been crossbred today, uh, that exist today, that probably not exist in the time of Noah. But the, the different species would have been included. Different species would have been there, plus the many different insects. Remember, the insects would not have been able to survive the flood. So there were insects also on the, in the ark of different sorts that were carried along and uh, survived in that way. And still with all that, with 75,000 animals, with a million insects, and those who did the calculations of that said that would still only fill the ark of about 60%. Less than two thirds of the ark would be filled up still with 75,000 animals, including dinosaurs and elephants. Because remember they would have brought the younger ones and the healthier ones and the ones that are still have many years of reproduction um, involved, uh, allowed and permitted. So it would have been smaller in that, in that way. 60% of the capacity had basically filled up. And so the remaining 40% of space would have been for storage of food, as God instructs Noah in, in just a few verses here, verse 21. Uh, as well as for living quarters for Noah and his family, because Noah and his family, like we, would need a little more space uh, than just the animals would, a, a pen or a nest to stay in. They would, uh, Noah and his family and the other humans on board uh, would be able to live on the other 40%, a little less than half the capacity of the ark. As you're finishing up writing this down, let me go ahead and read from chapter six, from verse 17 down to verse 22. And I, this is the Lord speaking again, the Lord says, and, and behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die, but with thee will I establish my covenant. And we'll talk about the covenant, I think, in the next slide. Uh, my covenant, my promise. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And if every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shall thou bring into the ark. Why? Verse 19 says, to keep them alive with thee. They shall be the two of every flesh. They shall be male and female. Verse 20, of the fowls after their kind, so with the different species, of the, of the cattle after their kind, the different species and they reproduce that way every creeping thing the insects and the reptiles that could not live in the water um, and the amphibians uh, every living thing of the earth after his kind two once again two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive a male and a female of every sort of every different species and kind shall come to noah and he's to keep, to be kept alive. Verse 21, and that take thou unto thee all, uh, of all the food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be, be food for thee and for them. So Noah's responsibility is to build the ark and to, and to provide the food. 
to gather the food. Remember, the animals don't do that. Animals go out and eat what they need, and, and they, just, they just concern about their daily needs. We humans are the ones who look toward disaster. We humans are the ones who look toward hard times. We're humans are the ones that put aside, go to the ant and consider her ways. Can everyone hear me? Everyone hear me? Okay, good. Praise the Lord. Uh, my internet went down, and I'm not sure why. I couldn't figure out what the problem was, but then praise the Lord, it came back up. So uh, let's, we'll try to we'll try to finish. We'll try to get through the rest of this hour without having more problems here. Let me see if I can get my get my uh, slides back up. Share screen. There we go. All right, let's go ahead and begin with prayer and we'll be ready to get back into our study. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to get the modern technology fixed. Thank you that I'm able to get back on through the internet. And Lord, continue to bless our class. Teach us about your word. Teach us about your mercy. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's see if we can get back uh, on here. We're almost done chapter six and moving into chapter seven. There it is. So God made a covenant or a promise for the preservation of life for all those living, uh, all the living things that are with, with Noah there in the ark. Everything inside the ark would be protected and would survive the cataclysm of the worldwide flood. God instructed Noah to gather food for the fam for his family and for the animals. And then verse 22, the last verse, uh, God emphasized Noah's obedience. Thus did Noah. And you got to understand what a step of faith that was for Noah to obey. Um, Noah's building a, a big boat. Now, they, they probably had, they probably had boats, I would think um in bible time in noah's time maybe for ship maybe for fishing on uh, uh well i guess they didn't eat fish they eat they, they only eat vegetables then but you know, for some reasons maybe for transportation they had boats maybe get from one side of a lake to another um maybe get one side of a river to another they had boats so they they, they had small boats but here noah was building this huge boat and, and even if it was near a body of water, it probably was not close enough to the bottom of water. And it's the people were thought he was crazy. And he was doing, and Noah was doing this for, you know, going 100 years, building this ark, over 100 years. 
And so I'm sure they had a lot of uh, thought, a lot of things about Noah. But God, this is what God thought about Noah. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. So Noah was obedient. And what a great example to us all. Okay, as we move in now to chapter 7, into chapter 7, of our study together here. Yep. It begins with an invitation. It says in chapter 7, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous, similar to chapter 6 and verse nine where he was called a just man for the yeah, i found righteous before me in this generation so come is an invitation and a choice and so noah and his family members had to choose god made the promise in chapter 6 verse 18 that he would make this ark have this ark built to, to protect noah his wife his sons and their wives but they still had they still had to know and his wife and their three boys sham ham and japheth and their wives still needed to walk into the ark they had a choice to make and they chose to obey, obey god verse two and three of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens the male and the female and of the beasts that are not clean by two the male and his female of the fowls also the air by sevens the male and the female to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth okay so a question comes out, um, and I think a legitimate question. You know, why would God bring in birds? Why would God bring in all the animals? You know, couldn't some of the strong animals, if it was only a local flood, if it was only a flood that that um, affected just um, you know their valley or just affected their area of the world, and not actually. The whole world then couldn't just the animals go to higher ground couldn't just the birds fly to the mountains uh if only a local flood then they would not need every kind of animal on the ark in order to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth obviously what i'm saying and and what the scripture is saying it wasn't just a local flood it was a worldwide flood so that's why they had to do that a second thing that thought out of this Notice this, um, we oftentimes, we all the time hear people talk about you know, the animals went on the ark two by two, and there were two, there was a male and female, a mommy and a daddy of every animal, but actually the scripture teaches there were actually seven of the clean beasts, seven of the clean beasts that went on there. Uh, there were, these clean beasts were beginning to be known by Noah and his his family but these clean beasts of course were codified in the law of moses which of course had not been written yet for a couple hundred years but these clean beasts uh were, were they were beginning to understand know what these clean beasts were for instance like lambs um these clean beasts and so forth uh the, the cattle um so seven of every clean beast and of the fowls it says in verses two and three and, and there's disagreement on that. Some say it was seven pairs um, and one extra. I, I kind of lean toward three pairs, which makes three pairs being six, and then one extra seven. Um, but three pairs, three males, three females, and then one extra. And as I wrote my notes there, you know, the three, the three pairs for proliferation uh and for domestication so the, the, they were to re help to reproduce more and more of them because these clean beasts were the ones that were being used in the sacrifices like uh like adam and abel and noah later on after the after the flood in the end of chapter eight we'll get to that next week they use these uh, clean beasts in sacrifice but also there were uh the three the three males and three females or three sets so there'll be even more clean beasts being being born and from reproduction and also this is what they would eventually god knew this but they eventually be eating a lot of these clean beasts and that's what's codified under the law of moses said you didn't eat the unclean you only ate the clean 
beasts. And uh, the Old Testament law verifies that. So, uh, so here we have two, generally speaking, two of every species, two of every animals, a male and a female. But of the clean beasts and the fowls, God said, told Moses, you take seven. You take, you take seven uh, of each of these. And the three pairs for reproduction and to domesticate and eventually for our own food as humans, but also one extra clean beast for sacrifice. But all the other animals, the unclean is up here, two, those two is all was needed. So two dinosaurs, they were, they were unclean beasts, two elephants, but of the sheep and of the birds and of the, um, the cattle uh, and so forth, a total of seven of those. And then God gave one last warning uh, in chapter seven, verse four, where God said, makes this announcement, for yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, 40 days and 40 nights. And every living substance that I've made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And then um, God makes it very clear. He is the one that's responsible for the flood. He is using it for judgment. But even in the midst of his judgment, what is he doing? He's showing mercy. He's showing mercy. Okay, seven more days, one more week before I'm going to send the, the water to judge the earth. Of course, most people rejected his calls. Most people rejected Noah's preaching. Most people said, it's beautiful and sunny outside. It's not going to rain. What is this rain? It doesn't even rain. What is this water falling from, from the sky? That doesn't happen. It's never happened during their lifetime. And so you know, we understand their skepticism, uh, but here's a God creator, God speaking, and still in mercy, giving them seven more days for final preparation, giving Noah and his family seven more days. Get the rest of that food together, Noah. Make sure there's enough food to provide for these animals for a year. And every living substance that is not on the ark will be destroyed, including, by the way, the vegetation. And so it was good for Noah to then to, to make sure there's enough food because there would not be in any food really at all during the time on the ark. And then for a while, even a little while afterwards until the vegetation could begin to grow again after the flood was over. And once again, what's emphasized is Noah's complete obedience, verses 5-9. through nine. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was, now he's 600 years old when the flood of the waters came upon the earth. Back in chapter 5 and verse 32, he was 500 years old, apparently when his sons were born. But now he's 600 years old when the flood came. And in verse 7 of chapter 7, And Noah went in, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of the clean beasts and the beasts that are not clean, so both the clean beasts and the unclean beasts, seven of the clean beasts, two of the unclean beasts, of the fowls, for the most part, two, uh, seven of those, um, and for the, and every living, everything that creepeth upon the earth, two of those, they went in two by two into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. So they went in, um, male and female, it's very important because God had the plan for reproduction. Verse 10, and it came to pass after seven days, that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. So God had told them what was going to happen, and they obeyed. And so the emphasis is on obedience, and Noah's obedience. But God's word is sure. God's word is sure. After seven days, verse 10 says, the waters of the flood came. And so he makes it very clear when that was. In the sixth hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the seventeenth day of that month, the same day, as God said, seven days from now and so forth, that same day, all the fountains of the deep, of the great deep, were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And so God keeps his word. Time was up. God had given 
mercy and extended mercy, he, a preacher of righteousness for 100 years named Noah, who had preached God's word. And here we are, uh, according to Henry Morse, 1,656 years after God created all of this, God destroyed all that did not put their faith uh, in his word and went to the ark. And Noah's 600th year, second month, the 17th day of his life. As I just read, God sent the flood by the breaking up of the fountains of the aquifers deep in the earth. So God did a through seismic um, activity, earthquakes uh, broke up the waters of the deep. They came spewing out, spraying out uh, of, the, of the ground, the breaking up of the ground. Um, that same Hebrew word, by the way, is found over in number 16. If you want to look there, it'd be good to see that used again. Number 16, verse 31. That breaking up is being used. Anyone, anyone know what, without, before we look, anyone know what, uh, how this word was used over number 16? Who, what's the reference? What's the context? Anyone know? If you do know, uh, go ahead. You can unmute your mic. Anyone before we, uh, before I spoil it for you and read it? Okay, number 16. So this is the rebellion of Korah and the other Levites who came, uh, came against a, uh, Moses and Aaron. Uh, they came and, and they want to know why Moses and Aaron were so special. They thought they should be and they, they challenged Noah and uh, I mean Moses and Aaron and and basically, basically, the Lord, um, you know, had them all go out together uh, before the tabernacle. And, and this is what happened. Uh, chapter number 16, verse 30 and 31. Um, but if the Lord make a new thing and the earth open up her mouth and swallow up the... I'm sorry, let's back up a little bit. And Moses said, verse 28, Hereby we shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own mind. He says, he says to the people, if these men, Korah and the followers, die, the common death of all men, they, they live to be old age and die. Or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, if they, so in the world, other words, they die or they live a full life, then the Lord has not sent me, Moses says. But if the Lord make a new thing and the earth open up her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertains to them and they go down quick into the pit, then shall, uh, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. So, you know, he says, he says, so I'm not talking about a natural disaster. I'm talking about a supernatural, miraculous, the earth opens up and swallows them. And so verse 31, and it came to pass as he made an end of the speaking, all these words that the ground clave asunder. It's the same word we find in Genesis 7, verse 11, um, baka. The, that the that the uh, earth the ground uh, opened up that was under them clave asunder it was open them and the earth opened her mouth verse 32 says and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertain to Korah and to all their goods they and all that appertain to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation boy that's a very graphic uh, way of showing who uh, who God had anointed and appointed there, as the as the earth opened up, swallowed them down, their houses, their their family members, and closed back up uh, on time. That was uh, to me that'd be terrifying, uh, but definitely communicated who God had sent. Well, this is the same word as I did: the earth opening up and swallowing down. You know, this this event is the same uh, word used there, baka. That was used by um, uh, used here in chapter Genesis chapter seven verse eleven of the breaking up of the great fountains of the deep. God broke them up. God um, disrupted them so they would come shooting out of the, the ground. I can only imagine they came probably shooting up like a geyser uh, from the ground, full of water. 
And so these underground fountains of the deep would come up and out through earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and the great tsunamis would then also be formed too. And it was, it was just terrible natural disasters from everywhere, water everywhere. And water coming down, of course, going up and then coming back down to people and then the, and the ground became saturated and started to fill water very quickly because there's so much water as it's described to the great deep, um, all the all the fountains of the deep. And of course, it also talks about the windows of heaven. So let's move on to the next slide and talk more about that. So the windows of the heaven also, it says here in, uh, this is verse 13. I'm sorry. This is verse 11. The windows of heaven were opened up. And many Christian scientists think that the earth uh, was created with that vapor canopy. Remember, I talked about that previously. Uh, we don't we don't know for sure because if it's true, the vapor canopy theory is that at the flood is when this vapor that surrounded the earth would have collapsed. Uh, the windows of heaven being opened, and they were, it would just simply fall into the ground. Because because skeptics once again today say, you know, if all the water in the clouds today all over India, the clouds over India, the clouds over America, the clouds over other parts of the world, over the oceans. If all the water in the clouds today were to collapse in 2021, and all the, all the of course, clouds are water vapor, water vapor, that's what clouds are. If all the clouds were to collapse and, and it rained to the earth and they're all exhausted, it only cover the earth by a couple inches. You know, and maybe maybe a couple feet at the most, but not cover the not cover the mountains. Um, so they said so it's impossible that, that it rained and all. Of course, what they don't account for, they're not reading the scripture. It wasn't there. It was also the aquifers of the deep. It was also the deep fountains uh, where we get our well waters from. All these are shooting up the water from below, but also I I believe. That this cape, this vapor canopy around the around the world also collapsed, and uh, it collapsed onto the onto the earth also. Which then it wouldn't have been just a couple of feet; it would have been, um, you know, hundreds, thousands of feet of water in the vapor canopy, which is no longer there because it all collapsed the earth and filled the oceans and so forth. And so many Christians believe that the earth was uh, made by this vapor canopy. And that would explain several things. Um, and maybe it's a totally different explanation altogether. But from what we, the little bit we know, looking back, since it's no longer there, that, would, uh, that vapor canopy would a source of vast amounts of rainwater. So, I mean, it rained, it says it rained 40 days and 40 nights. That the windows of heaven were open. It kind of gives you a sensation of just simply pouring the water out, not just over your city, but over the whole world. Just the water's just dumping down on top of us. The canopy for 40 days and 40 nights were dumping upon the earth. That would create a lot of water that would rise very quickly to lift an ark off the ground and then eventually to rise over the mountains. So number one, the vapor canopy would explain the, the vast amounts of rainwater that came during the flood. Number two, it would also give a reason for people living so long before the flood. Remember, people were living the 600, 700, 800. Um, the longest person we know of in the Bible, we're going to Bible, was 969 years of age, Methuselah. Same, and we're talking about the same years we are. So we're talking about someone who's living 10 times 11 times, 12 times longer than we are, 969 years. Well, the sun's ultraviolet rays would have been filtered out by this vapor canopy. Those are the rays, those ultraviolet rays are, are what ages us. Also, it's what causes some diseases like cancers that we, that we face. And so th this was going on. It also destroys a lot of our crops. The ultraviolet rays are necessary for our crops to grow, but also they, 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 um, they hinder our crops from growing fully. So that's going on. And thirdly, a discovery of tropical plants under the ice caps. And they still can't explain that. How do we find uh, palm trees? They find uh, tropical plants of different sorts growing on, under the North and South Pole, mainly the North Pole. South Pole hasn't been explored much under the North Pole. How could that be? Well, because at one time, 
according to the vapor canopy theory, the the Earth was was uh, this temperature of the Earth from the North Pole and the South Pole and all the way around the equator was all very moderate, pretty much the same degree, same temperature. So animals could roam, uh, even reptiles like like um, dinosaurs could roam up uh, across the North Pole. Tropical plants could grow up there. Um, there was not an issue with cold and, and hot. It was pretty moderate and a growing season all the way around because of the vapor canopy, they kind of kept everything in there and kept everything moderated um, as it filtered out the sun. So the vapor canopy may or may not be uh, the answer to that, but it seems to be a pretty strong hypothesis and we'll have to just wait to heaven to find out for sure. But it does answer the question about where all this rain came from that fell for 40 days and 40 nights. It does explain why before the flood, people were living to be seven, eight, nine hundred years old. After the flood, people were only living to be 300, 200, 100 years old. And we'll see that as we continue on even through Genesis chapter 11. And then discovery of tropical plants. Once again, we see Noah had faith in the accuracy of God's word. Noah and his family obeyed and were rescued, were saved. So let's go ahead and read that, verses 13 through 16 to begin with. Uh, in that self-same day, okay, so God said seven days, and it will, it will start raining. Uh, in the self-same day entered Noah and Sham and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl of the air, every fowl, excuse me, after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two by two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they went, and they that went in went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And then it says, and the Lord shut him in. Okay, the Lord shut the door of the ark. So Noah had faith in the accuracy of God's word. He didn't go on one last trip and go away and say, well, you know, God didn't really mean it seven days. Yes, verse four, God meant seven days. He didn't give mercy for seven more days, but they need to be in the ark on that day seven. And Noah's whole family and the living things, male and female of all of them, entered the ark and as i emphasize already in verse 16 the lord shut him and them in the lord secured and protected noah um the lord secured and protected noah um and his family once they by faith entered into the ark so they, they obeyed they did what god said to do and god blessed them god provided for them okay Okay, continuing on through verse 17. So we had this universal, not a local, not a um, tranquil flood, but a universal world-destroying flood that's being described here. The word prevailed is used one, two, three times here, uh, or three verses here. I think it's four times total, but used here. Uh, as a reminder, like verse 18, I left it off there, um, as a reminder of, of how it overwhelmingly was mighty over the whole earth. It prevailed, in other words, what the flood did. And we'll see that as I read through here. So it covered the whole earth. As a result of this cataclysm, cata cataclysma, uh, there was a major moving of the tectonic plates, causing the mountains to rise and the valleys to, to, to sink. And we're going to read Psalm 104 in a minute as well. So we've got two verses we'll look at after I read the Genesis portion. So verses 17 to 20 says this, And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased. So the waters kept pouring, pouring, pouring uh, for 40 days, and the waters increased, and they lifted up uh, the ark. It bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. Okay, so above the land. It went up, and the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. 
and the ark went upon the face of the waters. So it was floating up there, it's bobbing back and forth with all the animals and so forth inside. It was up on top. It wasn't underneath the water like all the other living things were, where they had drowned. It was up there floating around and bobbing around. So the water prevailed and the ark went upon the face of, of the waters, verse 19. And the waters, pre, here's the word again, prevailed. The waters prevailed upon the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. So all the high hills were covered. We're going to talk about that in a minute, too. All the high hills were covered. They were under the earth. And in verse 20, 15 cubits, which is approximately uh, 22 feet. Um, yeah, about 22, to less than 25 feet. Uh, upward did the, the waters prevail over the mountains, okay? Over the, over the tall hills, or the high hills, as verse 19 calls them. And the mountains were covered as well. So let's pause there again. So we're talking about this destructive flood, how tall, how high the water's got, and some of the other things going on there with the um, with the mountains and the high hills. So let's look at Job 12, verse 15. One, uh, one cross-reference to this. Job 12, 15. Where by inspiration of God's word, uh, by God, uh, God's spirit, chapter 12, verse 15, Job says this, uh, Behold, he withholdeth the waters, and they dry up. Also, he sendeth them out, and they overturn the earth. So a reference back to the flood. Noah believed, I mean, Job believed in the flood. Job, Bible scholars believe Job probably lived during the same time as Abraham. We'll talk about the fact that Abraham, Abraham knew about the flood as well. He, obviously, Abraham was not alive during the flood, nor was Job, but it wasn't that far in the past. And we'll talk about that, you know, as we get near the end of the class. But it wasn't that far in, in Abraham's or, Job, or Job's past that the flood had taken place, maybe about 100 years. So he, they still were talking about that. The descendants were still talking about what had happened there. Um, and what, what they have found out from Sham, Ham, and Japheth. But the, the Lord says about uh, the floods overturned the earth. The floods basically tumbled the earth, tumbled the earth and everything that was in it. And, and if you've ever seen a major flood from a, even a cyclone, though it's not a worldwide flood, it's only a localized flood where the water is that it, it moves cars, it moves buses, it'll wash away um, bridges, it'll move big boulders, the power of water. And that's a, from a cyclone going down to uh, maybe one of your cities or through a river going through your city or something like that. Because imagine if it's a worldwide flood, overwhelmingly mighty. And then so as a result, the second point says, they talking about the mountains, look at Psalm 104 with me. Yeah, the psalm that refers back to the flood as well and what God did but with the mountains and so forth. And we'll talk about mountains a little bit before we move on. Psalm 104. With a psalm that says, who laid, talking about the Lord, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. Thou coverest the earth with, a, with the deep, with the water. Okay, that's a reference. The deep is the idea of the water. Thou coverest the earth as with a with the deep as with a garment like if you were just lay it over top lay a, uh, a coat or a jacket over top something that covers the whole thing so the waters did the water stood above the mountains verse six says at thy rebuke at the lord's rebuke they fled at the voice of thy thunder they hasted away verse eight they go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys unto the place which thou hast founded for them. So, uh, all right, trying to mute, mute whoever we're hearing in the background here. All right, looks like we're all good. We're all good now. Thank you. So even the waters 
They go down to the mountains, they go down to the valleys. Verse 9 even says, Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over for the waters. Now we call that our, our shores, our coast, that they turn not again to cover the earth. So God allowed it this one time, but God does not do it anymore. The, the, the storms may come, the cyclones come, tsunamis come and hit our, our countries, hurricanes come. God still allows the water to drain back out into the oceans, not cover and destroy the whole earth like it did before. So God made our earth. God made our earth not as one solid core. In fact, there's a, there's a lava core in the center. Suppose it's very hot. But our earth is covered with these plates, plates all around, uh, all around our earth. And, and our earth does move. It has some flexibility for moving for moving um, under our feet. Most of the times we cannot feel that. It does not affect our houses. It's only when there's a fault line, like there are certain places in the world. Not, I don't think it's too many around India, but over in Asia, along, along the Pacific Ocean, there's a lot of fault lines there. Uh, these things are shifting. They move and, and, as, and, and plates are like two different Oh, let me try to illustrate to you. Are like two different. Um, if I can find illustration. Plates are like pieces of wrapped around the earth, and what happens when they move? If they hit each other, then something happens. For instance, look at this. As these plates come, and they're, they're separate, I guess. But when they hit each other, something happens. Like the form. That's how the mountains are formed, and they push up like that. So they're, they're constantly shifting. Now on the other side, where, where uh, they move apart, then valleys are formed. But when they come together, and that's what happened north of your country there in the Himalayans, where the tectonic plates were moving against each other, as they pushed against each other, they formed the mountains. And they still are, they, these plates still continue to push against each other till today. Um, and, and this is going on, and this goes on so slowly, we cannot see it happen in our in our time by our observation. There are scientists who study this, and they observe, you know, the mountains rise. Um, what is it like an inch a year or something like that? It's very small amounts, and that's part of their evolutionary theory. They say, well, the mountains rise an inch a year. If Mount Everest or whatever you call your your, your what we call Mount Everest there in your country, um, if the mountain is growing one inch or two inches a year and it's 29,000 feet above sea level, then they go back and say, well, then they, they've always gone two inches a year. It's always grown two inches a year. So if we go back, we see that obviously it was there millions and millions, and almost a billion years ago. And they, they go back to their long periods of time, totally don't understand that during the flood, it wasn't growing one, one inch a year during the flood. During the year the flood, the tectonic plates were pushing, or as, as it says here, where the Genesis chapter 7, founds the deep, uh, great deep are broken up. The windows of heaven are being opened. Um, that's in chapter 7, verse 11. Um, verses 19 and 20, where the, the waters prevailed on the earth and the high hills are under the whole heaven. You know, and, and while we read in Psalm 104, I mean, there's some violent things going on. They're hitting each other, pushing each other up and mounds are being formed and growing very quickly. And, and so that that's going on, not at one or two inches a year, but they it probably during the flood time, uh, hundreds of feet per per year or per day, perhaps, and that went on for a while. Apparently, even afterwards, as our as our world adjusted to its new climate, we'll get to that also. The universal flood is a major problem for for uh, scientists today. Um, it's a major problem for scientific skepticism, even for some who call themselves Christian. One reason, and now we're going to Second Peter three. Now, I told you we're getting there today. Uh, one reason is because it contradicts uniformitarianism. I just alluded to that just a moment ago, but uniformitarianism is the belief in science that everything continues at the same rate in which it happens today. So if, if uh, the mountains are growing, arising by an inch per year, 
then they go back, like I said, and say, obviously, our world was evolved uh, millions and billions of years ago, and they have calculations for that, but all based upon the fact that everything happened happens at the same rate. That's what's called uniformitarianism, at the same rate that everything happens. And so they base whole theories on that. And uh, by inspiration, Peter, Peter refers to that, the skeptics, going back to Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 3, he says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, their own desires, and they're saying in verse 4, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. All things continue as they were. What do they mean by creation? It's the beginning of time. Um, they all seemed as they were. Everything's at the same rate. You know, what's going on? I thought, I thought you said God was going to come back and this is going to happen. What's going on? And they scoff on that. Well, let's go ahead and move on through here a little bit longer. Verse 5 talks about the flood itself. Um, verse 4 is talking more about the creation. But verse 5 says, for this they willingly are ignorant of. They deliberately overlap this fact. They deliberately ignore um the deliberately will ignore what's happened like a Mount St. Helens that by the word of God, by God's very spoken word, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. It says they ignore the fact that God spoke these things in existence. They were created in six days. There's evidence for that. Or as one famous evolutionist said about 20 years ago, you know, as you look at at everything and nature, there appears to be a designer, but since there's no God, it must have all evolved. They, they are willingly ignorant of the truth. And part of their willingly ignorant of is the evidence that the earth was standing out of the water and in the water. There was a flood. And in fact, verse six explains that flood, whereby the, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Okay, and that word overflowed is a, is a Greek word from which we get the game's word cataclysm. Cataclysmos is the Greek word. And so the earth was overflowed. It was, a, it was a cataclysmic, worldwide turning over type of event that took place. Noah's flood, the worldwide flood. So they're skeptical of that because they, they don't want to give up the uniformitarianism because once they do that, then, then they, they're acknowledging a supernatural. And because one of the key things that the evolutionists and the ungodly scientists want to do is, is believe in what they call as naturalism. Everything happens without any outside supernatural influence. Everything can be explained by nature and natural things. So uniformitarianism is part of their preaching. But the other thing, the other, other reason why they're having a major problem with that is because to acknowledge then that there is indeed a creator who made the world in six days, who makes man in his own image who, who um, judge the world with the worldwide flood. To acknowledge these things means that they, those scientists, and you and I have to answer, will answer to a judge, the creator, who is our judge as well. And they, they try to avoid that at all costs. They don't want to acknowledge as a creator because to acknowledge a creator acknowledges a judge because if someone makes us, then we're responsible for them. If, I, if I'm all myself and, and I am the most important thing, I'm the highest on the rank, then I don't have to answer anyone. And that's how modern man likes to live. But the, we, we serve a God who created us and a God to whom we are responsible. So uh, Romans brings that out. For time's sake, we don't have a chance to go there, but you can look at these passages of scripture as well. Okay, going back to Genesis 7. The waters covered the mountains. That's what it says there. And so some come back and say, well, how could, how could the earth be uh, cover Mount Everest uh, in, in the northern Himalaya mountains, tallest uh, mountain on earth? How could the earth, um, how could the water cover 29,000 feet? Which all of that's now above. Uh, excuse me, above India, but all of that is 
how could it cover 29,000 feet? But um, with it moving from Psalm 104, from what's said here in Genesis 7, with the tectonic plates also on, it's very likely that the that the mountains of today were much shorter, much lower than the mountains of um, of the time of the flood. In fact, it's even called where it was in verse 19 of chapter 7, the high hills, uh, and called mountains there. Uh, so the waters covered the mountains. Many Christian scientists believe the mountains were not as tall then as now as a result of that seismic activity, the earthquakes, the rumblings of the earth, dur during and even after the flood until today. Like I said, it's still now, still pushing against each other, still growing something like two inches a year, many of the mountains are. Well, these, this was the end result of what has happened violently during the flood, which you could have been rising, like I said, hundreds of feet every day. Uh, pushing together. Plus today, uh, you can find even among some of the top of them of most mountains, the highest mountains, uh, sea life fossils. Why would that be? Because at one time that part, that mountain was underwater during the destruction. That's why it's not that it's not that some hikers, you know, had ate seafood up there. But that's not how fossils are formed. Very few fossils are formed today. Um, but that's, uh, that's because a fossil was formed when that part of the mountain, that mountain actually laid under the water. Like I said, here we go again, an example. So here, I mean, this is under the water. Just imagine that the water was covering all these areas as it was at one time. And these tectonic plates are still pushing against each other, but still it's under the water. And, and, and then as they, the plates are pushing, eventually coming up out of the water, and climbing hundreds or thousands of feet above the sea level. But it, originally, it was just very much lower under the water. So when animals and critters, creatures were killed uh, and, and buried very quickly and fossilized, uh, it, they, were, they were on, you know, on, on the, under the water. But then as the mountains climbed, those fossilized critters uh, in the rock beds and so forth are up there way up thousands of feet above sea level because at one time the mountains were under the water. Every living thing on dry land died. Verses 21 to 23 makes it very clear. And all flesh moved, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both the fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life and all that was in the dry land died. Okay, he is, God is very much emphasizing that this destroyed everything and everyone who breathed air, animal life, and humans who were not on, in, in, not on the flood, or not in, on the ark, excuse me, not on the ark. In verse 23, and every living substance was destroyed, blotted out, wiped out, which was upon the face of the ground both man and cattle and creeping things in the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed, blotted out, wiped out from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they there were with him in the ark. So every living thing on dry land died. That's what is emphasized over and over again. The only things that survived were the things that were in the ark. Fossils are found all over the world today as a result of the rapid burial of living things by water and mud. So that's how fossils are formed. Fossils are not formed, um, and I'm wrapping it up. I'm coming to a close here at the end of chapter 7. Fossils are not formed much today because it requires rapid burial of things. Uh, the, now, if you had a big cyclone that came into India uh, that, that dumped a lot of water and uh, and and this water came and, and, and went through cities or towns and knocked over houses and people were living in the houses and they were quickly buried by water and mud under hundreds of feet or 100 feet or, 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 or 20 feet of, of um, mud. Uh, these people sadly would, would suffocate and would be, would be mummified and buried. No air could get to it, no, uh, because it was buried very quickly, lots of pressure pushing down on it. And uh, this is what happened, not just in a city, this happened all over the world. 
And uh, of course, where did things go? They would go to the low spots. That's where the water and the mud would go. They go to the low spots and fill out. And as today we find fossil beds in low spots where water and mud drained and hardened and became rock of the years. In fact, many of these places are where the coal mines are. The coal and the carbon from there oftentimes is formed from these same fossil beds. And as I mentioned a week or two ago, Mount St. Helens that occurred in 1980 here in Washington State in the United States allowed scientists to see in real time a volcano reaction, melting the snow that became water, water and mud, burying people and animals and other things um, alive. And they were fossilized. Um, and they, they were able to just a few years later find fossils that in their previous studies before observing this, they were taught in school as a geologist, these fossils are millions of years old, but they knew they just got fossilized in the past couple of years. And so it really has harmed the, the theories um, of evolution and fossils, but it's really confirmed what the scripture teaches. So these are fossils. And then one more thing, and you get an animal, let's say you have an animal that goes wandering out into the, the fields. Um, and this doesn't happen very often in India, but let's say an animal goes out in the fields and, and dies. Um, it doesn't become a fossil usually. Usually the birds uh, will pick at it. Other animals will eat of it. Um, even the, the, the uh, rodents would get some of it. And then the, the insects would, would begin to decompose and it would decompose. And some situations may totally disappear over a long period, over a period of time. That's not the same as a fossil. Fossils are when living things are buried rapidly by water and mud. No air gets to it to decompose it. No other, no maggots are there. No other animals are eating off of it. It's buried very quickly and it eventually disintegrates. And what's left is a hardened or a rock kind of, um, rock kind of um, imprint or or a petrified bones, petrified means turned to rock, bones uh, that then are our fossils today from like from the dinosaurs and so forth. Because the dinosaurs and the elephants and, and people were all fossilized and in, in, in under the, in the fossil beds and mixed together. Like I said, a lot of that is where we actually get our coal from today that we burn our fuel by, that we heat our houses with and the coal that we get coal beds are formed really from fossil beds. And lastly, it says in verse 24, and the waters prevailed. So once again, over top, covered upon the earth 150 days. The water was on the earth approximately five months, 150 days. That's how long it took after the rain, 40 days and 40 nights, and the earth was covered for, 100, for 150 days before they began to drain down enough to be able to see the mountains. When we come back next week, Lord willing, we'll pick up a chapter 8, verse 1, which, which is an encouraging verse because it says, And the Lord remembered Moses, excuse me, remembered Noah, and began to show favor toward Noah again after all these events took place. So let's go ahead and um, get to our homework. If I can fast forward through here. There it is. So I'm going I'm to have you actually read. Um, Genesis 8 and 9, because we hadn't fin quite finished. We're going to get into 9 next week, but I want you to read Genesis 8 and 9 at least three times. Continue to think upon these things and work through these things. Think through what is going on there and how God remembers mercy. And pray and prepare you, begin preparing your next sermon on, the, on one of the phrases of chapter six, seven, or eight. And if, unless you've already chosen one outside of that, I'm kind of giving you some examples of some phrases you can you can develop a sermon from. And so begin doing that. That's what we probably do uh, two weeks from today, two weeks from today, uh, which will be the 27th. So you'll have two weeks of work on this, but here's some examples. And these are, these are phrases that you, that you find here in chapter six, seven, and eight, for instance. Um, or if you choose another phrase already in Genesis 1 through 11, that's fine. But here are three examples and develop that, follow that, these thoughts throughout scripture. This is the, this is the first mention, but develop it throughout scripture. 
for instance, the phrase, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Does the Bible talk about that? Almost every prophet of the Old Testament talks about that. David, King David talks about that. Um, Paul talks about that in Romans. So that's a theme, major theme in scripture, the, the, the spiritual depravity of man. Uh, or, or Noah walked with God. I already gave a little bit of sampling of walking with God. Enoch walked with God. You and I can walk with God. Trace that throughout scripture, develop a sermon from that phrase. Or um, when we looked at today, Noah did uh, unto did according unto all the Lord commanded him. So trace the idea of obedience and other obedient servants of God and how we should be obedient to the Lord as well. But we're beginning work on this sermon. It's going to be done due in two weeks. Um, and uh, I'll give you the due date for sure next week. But work on this. Once again, these sermons are designed to help you dig deeper into our text, but also designed to give you sermons to be able to preach in your churches or in your ministries. Uh, I don't like just give you busy work to do. I want you to find practical things to do with our studies. That's a doctoral, there's a doctoral ministry level courses are designed to be practical and helpful in these ways. Okay, Lord willing, next week uh, we'll get into, we'll finish chapter eight and get into chapter nine. We may have an opportunity for a few questions next week. We'll see how it goes. But that's all for now. We went a little over. Thank the Lord we were able to uh, get our internet connection back up again and, and study and encourage you to continue to study God's word and, and see our God, how powerful and wonderful he is. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. You're welcome. God bless.